On today's Locked On Giants podcast, is defensive coordinator Shane Bowen an upgrade over former defensive coordinator Wink Martindale? I've got that for you, plus a lot more coming your way next. You are Locked On Giants, your daily New York Giants podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, New York Giant fans, and welcome to another edition of the Locked On Giants podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast family, your team every day. I'm your host, Patricia Trana, credentialed member of the New York Giants media for Locked On, as well as for the New York Giants team site over on the Fan Nation Network. You can find the written work at si.com slash NFL slash Giants. And welcome on in to my Blue Crew community members, to my everydayers, to my newcomers and everybody in between. Thank you so much for spending part of your day with us here on the Lock on Giants podcast. It is appreciated. And on today's program, we're going to kick things off with a look at is Shane Bowen, the new defensive coordinator, an upgrade or a downgrade over what the Giants had with Wink Martindale. So I've got some stats, some figures, some thoughts about that. Then in segment two, we're going to sort out the defensive line. You know, that's the one position, or one of uh, several positions, really, where I'm really not sure if they have enough or how they're going to deploy. But I did some research. I put some stuff together. I'm going to kind of tell you how it. I think it's going to shape up and what makes the most sense for the defensive line. And then finally, we'll wrap things up with the Darren Waller decision, which is coming any day now. Should the Giants take Waller, uh, make the decision for Waller? Should they let him continue to drag this out? You know, just some thoughts on that uh, that I'm going to pass along, as well as a lot of you asked me, what are the implications if Waller returns, if he doesn't return, so on and so forth. So I'm going to go over all that with you. So again, welcome on in and let's get started because as usual, we have a lot that we need to cover. All right. Let's start off with the big question. Is Shane Bowen, the new defensive coordinator, an upgrade over Wink Martindale, or is he a downgrade? Now, here's what's interesting. A lot of people will say, well, you know, when he was with Tennessee, the defensive coordinator down there, how much of that defense was his versus how much of it was Mike Vrabel's, the head coach at the time, who was a defensive-minded coach? I don't know the answer to that. I think only Shane Bowen probably knows the answer. But in hearing some of what Shane Bowen has had to say with how he plans to approach running a defense in terms of blitzing, in terms of playing the run, in terms of just about you know coverage and all that other stuff, there are some noticeable differences. All right, so let's talk quickly about the defenses first, and then we'll get into whether or not this has the potential to be an upgrade or a downgrade over Wink Martindale. All right, difference number one, uh, Bowen is going to probably do a lot less blitzing than what Wink Martindale did. Wink Martindale was, you know, very famous for dialing up all kinds of exotic blitzes. You had corner blitzes, safety blitzes. I mean, he was just blitz happy. And, you know, there were positives to that and there were negatives. And, you know, amongst the negatives is you taking a guy out of coverage now to, you know, play the back end of the defense. All right. The run defense, um, the Giants under Wink Martindale, the run defense really wasn't as good as it could have been. It was usually like towards the bottom half of the league. And I wonder if some of that wasn't a result of guys playing out of position. So we will talk about that probably a little bit more in, in segment two when I sort out the defensive line for you, but that was a problem. I thought some guys played out of position uh, on the defense. And then you had the defensive secondary, all right? The defensive secondary, Wink was pretty much into man coverage. He seemed to like his cornerbacks and defensive backs to play man coverage as opposed to playing zone. Now, zone supposedly is easier for a young player to learn because it's just a matter of, you know, being aware of what your zone is, what your area of the field is that you're responsible and making sure that you cover it. So, you know, zone coverage has its advantages just as man does, but um, you know, for whatever the reason wink like man coverage better. Um, 
maybe because of the all the blitz sinking data, you know, that could be a reason, but uh, it wasn't always effective. So, you know, that being said, let's take a look at what Bowen likes to do. Bowen believes in get the pass rush with the front seven, all right, leaving the back end of the defense to go into coverage, which is what their job is, all right? Bowen is also more about zone coverage than he is about man coverage. Now, as far as, you know, the run game, I need to see how that all kind of factors, you know, how that all comes together. But I have a feeling that Bowen is not going to have guys out of place. And again, I'm jumping ahead a little bit because I'm going to talk about this in segment two, but there were guys who were out of place um, and who, for whom that I think Wink was maybe guilty of trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. And we'll talk about that in the next segment. All right. So let me give you some numbers here. First off, let me answer the question. I think Bowen is going to be an upgrade over uh, Wink Martindale. All right. Why do I think that? Uh, let's start with the blitz. All right. So last year, the Giants blitzed 45% of the time which was the second most in the league. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but you better be getting home with your pressures, all right? The Giants weren't doing that. They got a 9% pressure rate, um, which was 18th in the league. They only managed 133 pressures, which was 19th, all right? So... If you are blitzing and you are not getting home, then, you know, you might want to rethink what you're doing because by blitzing like crazy, you're taking a guy out of coverage and you're hurting the back end of your defense, especially when you have, you know, a young defense, which or defensive secondary, I should say, which they kind of did last year. All right. They had obviously Deontay Banks, a rookie was back there. You know, Jason Pinnock was in his first year as a starter. Um, you know, they they played different guys there when Adore Jackson wasn't there. Um, they tried uh, Trey Hawkins the third, who was a rookie. Y you know, you got to get those guys support. And you know, I get it. You want to play your your style of game. You don't want to have to, you know, make concessions because of circumstances. But I often felt that Wink Martindale was a little too rigid and a little too married to doing certain things. And sometimes you got to adjust. You can't just say, you know, the heck with it. I'm going to do what I'm going to do me and, and, you know, let bygones be bygones. Let the, you know, let the chips fall where they may, um, because that's going to come back and it's going to bite you. All right. Now let's take a look at what Shane Bowen did with regards to the blitz. The Titans last year had a 22% blitz rate, which is the ninth lowest in the league. They generated pressures on 18% of their blitzes. So the two numbers, the 22% blitz rate versus the 18% pressures, a little bit closer than the Giants, 45 and nine. All right. So right off the bat there, um, that's a positive. So the Titans, they generated 122 pressures off of the blitz, which is only 11 less than what the Giants generated. But again, the Titans weren't blitzing as much as the Giants. Um, now let's talk about the run game, the run game real quick. Um, we'll mention Tennessee was ranked 13th, um, 107 .7 yards per game. The giants were ranked 29th, 132.4 yards per game. So if Bowen carries over what he did with Tennessee and I get it, there's different personnel. Maybe he does some different things. Maybe he does some new things. I, I understand all that. But if he carries over what he did in, in, in t Tennessee to the Giants, this Giants defense has the potential to be upgraded under Shane Bowen. Now, we have to see how it all comes together. Obviously, the addition of Brian Burns is going to help. Um, having the front seven is going to take some of the onus off of the back end. Uh, especially if that front seven can get home when they are asked to pressure the quarterback. Um, you know, because remember in that back seven, you're going to have probably a rookie safety, Tyler Newbin, who's probably going to play um, alongside of Jason Pinnock. Um, the cornerback position, you're going to probably have Cordell Flott. 
um, who's going to be the full-time starter there, assuming he wins the job. So that's one half of that defensive secondary that right now, I think we can all probably agree, creates some question marks. We need to see if that defensive secondary can come together. So the last thing you want to do if you're Shane Bowen is now start asking those guys to blitz like on a regular basis. Now that doesn't mean that Bowen won't ask them to blitz on occasion. He has said as much that if he has to send six or seven guys, he will. But I just don't think we're going to see it as often, nor do I think we're going to see the exotic blitzes that we saw that Wink Martindale liked to run. So to, again, the answer to the question, do I think that Bowen is going to be an upgrade over Martindale based on the stats, based on the philosophies, based on the personnel? My answer is yes. No offense to Wink, but you know, you live by the blitz, you die by the blitz. And if you don't adjust, then what's the point, right? All right, folks, coming up next, we're going to talk about the defensive line, the question marks there, and we're going to try and sort some of them out and also come up with some of the solutions uh, to what's a very interesting puzzle. So don't go anywhere. I'll have that for you right after this. Hey, Giant fans. So let me tell you about Yahoo Finance, our sponsor today. If you have trouble keeping up with multiple investment and retirement accounts, you need to check out Yahoo Finance. Yahoo Finance lets you consolidate multiple accounts into one hub, plus it gives you access to expert analysis to make informed decisions affecting investment opportunities. For more than 25 years, Yahoo Finance has been the brand behind every great investor. Yahoo Finance offers all the tools and data you need in one place. They are the number one finance destination, producing a holistic look at the financial news cycle, including breaking news, original editorial perspectives, analyst ratings, independent research, customizable charts, and so much more. Securely link your brokerage accounts for a unified view of your wealth, including 401ks and other investments. A comprehensive perspective is what sets apart great investors, and it's how Yahoo Finance ensures that you have the insight to look at your wealth in its entirety. For comprehensive financial news and analysis, visit the brand behind every great investor, yahoofinance.com, the number one financial destination. That's yahoofinance.com. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Locked on Giants podcast. I'm your host, Patricia Trena, and coming up on the Locked on Giants podcast, OTA number three is on Thursday. Giants started OTAs on Monday, so they ran one on uh, Monday, two on Tuesday. Number three is going to be on Thursday, and number three just so happens to be open to the media. So I will be at that OTA. I'll have notes, observations, takeaways, all the good stuff that you you guys demand and expect from me here at the Lachlan Giants podcast. So the plan right now is for me to have a show for you Thursday uh, afternoon, as soon as I can get to it, um, as soon as I get home, um, get everything set up and, and uh, ready to go. So I will knock that out for you as quickly as I can. So that's definitely coming up here on the Locked on Giants podcast. Hope you will check it out. Appreciate your support. All right. In this segment, let's talk about the Giants defensive line. All right. Now, a little background here. Once upon a time, I always believed that the New York Giants defensive line was the strength of this team, offense and defense. All right. You had Dexter Lawrence and you had Leonard Williams and those two uh, formed a, a solid one-two punch. And then, of course, we know that um, Leonard Williams was traded away to Seattle, leaving the Giants with Dexter, who is, you know, a, a cornerstone of that unit. And then the Giants plugged in Sean Robinson, a free agent that they had signed last offseason to kind of ride, the, ride out the rest of the season. Well, Sean Robinson is no longer with the team. He, is, he left, and I believe he signed – in free agency, I want to say with Carolina. So the question now becomes for me, what did the Giants do? How do they sort this defensive line out? You know, who's Dexter's backup? Who plays next to him on the line? What's this going to look like? Well, let's try and sort all this out. All right. First off, 
Jordan Riley, last year's seventh round draft pick, I think he is the backup to Dexter Lawrence. Jordan Riley is the guy who can play both in the A gap, the B gap. Um, he's, he's more of an A gap guy, though, more of a, a natural nose. So I think that's going to be Jordan Riley's role moving forward. Now, interestingly, DJ Davidson, who was a draft pick a couple of years ago, I believe he was a fifth round pick or fifth or six, I forget which, but anyway, he's a guy who can play, who has position flexibility. He can play, you know, the one tech or the three tech uh, if need be. But there's a couple of guys that I want to mention that I think are going to really play into this equation. One of whom I believe was last year at any rate played out of position uh, for the Giants and really didn't make much of an impact. The first guy I want to talk about is Ryder Anderson. Ryder Anderson, you know, didn't make the 53-man roster, obviously, last year. He was a guy who had bulked up, a guy who, you know, they were hoping would show enough to, to you know, stick around and, and make a contribution. Okay, Ryder Anderson last played in 2022. He didn't have any snaps in 2023. Um, in 2022, he played 117 snaps as the, a three-tech. So I'm wondering now if perhaps he's going to be in the mix to compete to play alongside of Dexter Lawrence on that defensive line. But the guy I really want to you know mention that I find is intriguing and a guy that I think the Giants maybe didn't really have a plan for him or maybe they just maybe that's not the right way to put it but maybe um the way based on how they deployed him they tried to jam a square peg into a round hole is Boogie Basham. Now Boogie Basham you'll re recall he was acquired via trade I believe it was before the start of the, the season last year for a Buffalo Bills player. Boogie Basham with Buffalo was at his best with his hand in the dirt. All right. The Giants more or less tried to play him as a stand up linebacker, and it didn't really work, to be honest with you. So, in looking up Boogie Basham's stats when he was with Buffalo in 2022, he played 250 snaps at left, uh, left. Outside end, the Leo. Um, he had four, he finished his career in Buffalo with four and a half sacks, eight quarterback hits. Um, last year, like I said, he came down and they kind of tried to use him as a stand up pass rusher and it didn't work. It just didn't work. So I think it is very possible that we will see Boogie Basham lining up more with his hand in the dirt, which appears to be more of a natural fit for him as opposed to having him stand up as a stand-up linebacker. And I think the reason why they might have tried that, to be honest with you, is because who'd they have last year? You know, Aziz Ojolari got hurt again. They had Kayvon Thibodeau, who, you know, at the time they didn't know what they were going to get from him in his second year. Thankfully, he produced and had a breakout season. And they had Jihad Ward. So, you know, Basham and Ward were almost, almost identical in terms of skill set ward, you know, being a wink Martindale favorite and also being a slightly better stand up linebacker got the nod. So, you know, Boogie Basham, just, you look at last year and you say, well, what did the giants bother sending a draft pick to get him for? He was a waste. I don't think he's going to be a waste this year. I think, you know, the giants are going to look to get him to play on um, that defensive line with his hand in the dirt, which seems to be his strength. Okay, so, you know, the Giants also have some young talent that they're going to be looking to develop. They have Casey Rogers. They have Chapman, uh, Elijah Chapman, who they signed uh, after a, a tryout from the rookie minicamp. These are all guys who could potentially be developed on the practice squad if they show enough and are solid enough in, in training camp. So, you know, in looking at this defensive line, which admittedly I, was a concern for me, I feel a little bit better about the possibilities of how the personnel is going to fall into place, how it's all going to shake out, and um, if the Giants can make it work. And I do believe that, you know, A, they have an excellent defensive line coach in Andre Patterson, who, of course, is assisted by Brian Cox. Uh, be so between those two guys and also the scheme that Shane Bowen is going to likely run with the Giants, I think that unit, that defensive line unit, which 
admittedly for me at any rate, was a concern not too long ago. I feel a lot better about how it could potentially shake out moving forward. All right, coming up next, Darren Waller. Decisions got to be made on him or by him pretty soon, sooner than later. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Should the Giants force the issue? Should they continue to give him his space? I'll give you my thoughts right after this. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Locked on Giants podcast. I'm your host, Patricia Trena. And please, if you're watching us on YouTube, subscribe to the channel, like the video, and don't forget to click the little bell so that you receive notifications every time I post a video here on the Locked on Giants YouTube channel. It is appreciated. Uh, all right, in this segment, Darren Waller, still no sign of him. Still, apparently, no decision from him regarding whether he's going to continue his career or if he's going to call it a career. And I've had people come to me and say, Pat, at this point, should the Giants just force the issue? Should they just cut him and be done with him? Folks, here's my take. Number one, the Giants have been giving Darren Waller his space all this time. You know, it came out that, you know, unfortunately, Darren Waller, and uh, his wife, NB WNBA star Kelsey Plum, uh, they're going through a divorce. And, you know, I've never gone through a divorce, but I know people who have. And I know it can be devastating. It can really make people question, you know, what they're doing in life, what their priorities are. So you've got to sit there and you've got to say to yourself, okay, is Darren Waller, you know, is that what he's going through now? Is he, you know trying to figure things out, you know, and then you add to the, to the equation that Darren Waller had once had that abuse history of uh, substance abuse and he has managed to keep himself clean. You got to think that the temptations, you know, especially when, when, with something as traumatic as a divorce, that there are temptations that pop up. So the giants have been giving him his space. They haven't pressed the issue. They haven't rushed him. I see articles online suggesting that the Giants should just flat out cut him, make the decision for him. I do not agree with those articles. Yes, I know about the salary cap savings, which I'll get to in a moment. But I think for the Giants to suddenly, you know, decide, you know, wake up, say tomorrow and say, hey, you know what? Enough's enough. We're going to make the decision for you. That would just be cold hearted. And I don't think the Giants are going to do that. I think they're going to let Waller make the decision on his own. All right. So what happens if Waller decides he wants to come back? Guess what, folks? The Giants will take him back. I really believe that. Now you're probably saying, well, what about, you know, Theo Johnson? You know, where's he going to fit in? Folks, if Waller returns, your tight ends are going to be Waller, Daniel Bellinger, and Theo Johnson. The odd man out is probably going to be Lawrence Cager. If Waller does not return, Bellinger, Theo Johnson and probably Lawrence Cager, or maybe one of Chris Manhurts and or Jack Stahl, depending on you know how they want to deploy the tight ends or what they feel they need as far as you know blockers go. So Waller coming back, if he's healthy and his heart is in it, the Giants will take him. Now, if his heart is not in it and he decides to call it a career, the Giants obviously. We'll wait until after June 1st for that announcement to be made. The benefit, obviously, they will save more on the cap. I think their savings jumps up from $6.7 million to something like $11 million. If they get that kind of savings after June 1st, remember, that savings they can't spend anyway. And I've often wondered, I have no proof of this, but right now the Giants have two unsigned rookie draft picks, Tyler Newbin and Theo Johnson. Both are participating, I believe, in the OTAs, having signed waivers, but they have not signed the rookie contract. So I'm wondering if it's because the Giants are dead last in cap space right now. And, you know, as long as they have those waivers, that you know, those two rookies can participate, even though they don't have a contract. But with Waller, if he does retire, and by the way, I do think he will retire, um, what will end up happening, obviously, the Giants will get a whole boatload of money, over $11 million to spend 
that will take care of now the Newbin contract. That will take care of the Theo Johnson contract. That will also be enough for the Giants to get through summer training camp and probably most of the season, right? Unless there's a big rash of injuries to where they have to keep replacing guys. So again, there's a benefit to waiting. The Giants can't use the money until after June 1st anyway. So let Waller have his space, let him make up his mind, come to the conclusion that he can live with, that he's at peace with. And if he walks away, as I think a lot of us think will be the case, the Giants will carry on. They protected themselves by adding, you know, Chris Manhurst, Jack Stoll, drafting Theo Johnson. They knew that eventually they were going to part from Darren Waller at some point, whether it be this year or next year. So they are protected either way. And, you know, again, for what Waller is going through with a divorce, you know, that can't be easy. I don't speak from experience. I, I Again, I've never been divorced. I hope I never get divorced. But I know people who have, and I, I can't imagine that it's easy. So um, all I could say about this is, look, Darren Waller, you know, in the limited exposure that I've had with him, seems like a really good guy. Um, I wish him the best as he sorts through this, you know, uh, a career changing, a life changing decision like this, you know, whether to retire and move on to the next phase of your life is never easy to make. It requires a lot of time, a lot of patience, a lot of reflection. And I just, you know, to those of you who are saying the Giants should just cut him and, and be done with it, have a little compassion for the guy. You know, it, it's just, I, I get it. You, you guys want, you know, the money, you guys want this, that, and the other thing. Some of you have soured on Darren Waller. But at the end of the day, he's a human. And, uh, you know, all that other stuff will work itself out. And hopefully, you know, Darren Waller, whatever he does decide, um, he will find peace in that decision. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for this edition of the Lot on Giants podcast. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. And again, don't forget, if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to the channel, click the little notification bell and like the video. It all helps us out. I'll be back tomorrow with an all new episode of Locked on Giants podcast. I will see you then.